cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We begin tonight with the aftermath of powerful storms that swept through Metro Atlanta. This video out of Sandy Springs where a tree toppled onto a car trapping someone inside. We're told crews were able to get them out safely. Sky Tracker capturing damage at the Aqualand Marina in Hall County. You can see boats ripped from their moorings and sections of the dock torn and waterlogged. Hall County EMA officials say multiple docks and boats were either damaged or destroyed, but fortunately no one was hurt. And here's a live look right now at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, as Isaias, now a hurricane, takes aim at the Carolina coast and continues to move up the east coast. The latest update bringing it again to hurricane strength. So let's get you straight over to Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb in the Storm Tracker Center. Chris, what's going on now? Oh, a lot happening here weather-wise tonight, not only locally, but also off the coast of the Atlantic. We're going to break all of this down for you in the extended look at this weather and what's happening here. First off, uh, we had a round of strong storms that rolled through a little bit earlier today uh, that caused damage in some spots. You just saw some of the video there, not only wind damage, but also some lightning, hail, and even flood uh, flooded areas areas in some spots. We're in a break in Atlanta right now. No rain moving through. Most of that heavier rain from earlier has pushed off to the east. We have a few lingering showers, though, that are left behind here in areas south and west of the city in uh, West Georgia. This here we are in Atlanta. If you go down 85 and then just north of that down toward LaGrange and then north of that into Heard County, we do have some uh, pockets of heavy rain and some thunder and lightning. Some of these had 40 mile an hour winds with this earlier, but now that is showing signs of weakening. That's trying to drift on over to the east. Also, that main line of showers and storms has pushed well off to the east right now. Moving into South Carolina, that back edge went through Athens late this afternoon and during the early evening and then continued to push to the east there. Also out uh, I-22 and in North Georgia, in Rabin County, it's all moved out. We had some showers and still a little bit of lingering rain right there on the South Carolina line around Lake Hartwell. The back edge of that is now moving through where you had some strong storms. Lake Oconee, you had strong storms earlier. Everything has pushed to the east of you as well. And as these storms move through, we had a lot of reports of damage. All of these indicators that you see here on the map show us where we had either wind damage or large hail that came through. Some of that in North Gwinnett, uh, in North DeKalb, Central Fulton County, South Fulton, 
Also up in Gordon County from the storms a little bit earlier as the whole system just kind of started up. Pickens County, Dawson County, here at Forsyth and Hall County where we saw that damage up at Lake Lanier at the marinas there. Also in North Gwinnett County and out in Oconee County and Rockdale County. We had some damage as the storms rolled through uh, just a little bit earlier today. Now we also had flash flood warnings. We mentioned this earlier at 5 and 6 o'clock tonight. All three of those warnings have now been canceled. They were in effect for Central Fulton, uh, also North DeKalb and western parts of Gwinnett. The heaviest rain that we had right there was near Norcross with a, a little more than two inches of rain that fell in a very short period of time. And that's what caused some of the uh, flooding that was moving through those areas as well. All right, let's take a look at this on the bigger picture because this is what I want to show you what is happening with now Hurricane Isaias. All throughout the day today, this was a tropical storm, and we were expecting that it could regain hurricane strength before it makes landfall later on tonight. Here it is just to the east of Charleston. That's the center of the storm. A couple things I want you to see here. A lot of folks have asked me if our storms today were part of the outer bands of Isaias. That's not the case. The outer bands with Isaias are over here and some of those in the South Carolina. Our storms today were ahead of a frontal boundary that's moving through and closer to our area. That's what triggered our showers and storms indirectly. We may have had a little more moisture coming in from the east ahead of that front that kind of kicked off some of those showers. Now look at these outer bands right now. Two new tornado warnings have just popped up right here at the coast of South Carolina and also here at North Carolina and those outer bands are causing that severe weather. So here's the center of the storm right here. Here's Charleston. Here's Myrtle Beach. The center of the storm right now, I know it looks kind of ragged. It's about 48 to 50 miles to the east of Charleston, but it's about 60 miles away to the south of Myrtle Beach. And we think this is going to continue moving up toward the north and that center or eye of the storm most likely is going to make landfall late this evening during the uh, late night hours tonight when we'll see that landfall. And we think it'll be right around Myrtle Beach or right there on the South Carolina and North Carolina line. Let's take a live look out there right now. This is how it looks at Wrightsville Beach. And you can see the really rough surf that's coming in ahead of that storm. And again, you don't have to focus just on the eye of the storm, but it's a really large storm that's impacting a lot of people with wind and rain in the area. Let's get a look at that track right now. Meteorologist Samantha Moore joins us. Sam, uh, that track looks like it is still going to be moving in later on tonight, right? Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, it has strengthened into a hurricane, and Isaias has also picked up its pace. So it does have those max sustained winds at 75 miles per hour, but it's moving to the north northeast at 16 miles per hour. So as you said, Chris, if it's around 50 miles east of Charleston and 60 miles south of Myrtle Beach, and it's moving at 16 miles per hour, kind of parallel to the coastline right now, north northeast, that's going to put it into that. South Carolina, North Carolina uh, state line area, most likely before midnight, maybe around the 10:30, 11 o'clock time frame. And of course, that's where they have the hurricane warnings in place right now in the red that you see here on the screen. The orange are the tropical storm warnings, and those extend well up the coast. And it will likely not stay a hurricane very long. Once it hits land, it'll get uh, weakened a bit by the friction that the land causes. That can also cause those tornadoes you were talking about, Chris. But as it moves to the north, it'll probably become a tropical storm once again, but still tropical storm force winds all the way up the coastline into New England and possibly even into eastern Canada, so towards Nova Scotia way. So there are those warnings that are in place. The red is the hurricane warnings. The other uh, less bright red is the tropical storm warnings on this map extending all the way into Maine at this hour. Pretty incredible. So the strongest winds will likely remain offshore, but still buffeting the east coast all the way up. It looks like Virginia Beach could see some very strong winds as this moves in. Norfolk as well as it moves past them. And then in towards New York City, they could see some tropical storm force winds and also some incredibly heavy rain as this makes its way up the coast. It could easily end up seeing some uh, three to four inches of rain as it moves its way through New York State. So coming up, we'll talk more about the impacts for the east coast of this storm and how our forecast is going to shape up after all the storms we saw today. Back to you guys. 
All right, Chris and Sam, thank you. Remember, you can download the 11 Alive News app for free right now and get those weather alerts sent straight to your phone. Well, it was back to school today for two Metro Atlanta school districts. We have a full list of the district's plans running at the bottom of the screen for you. Students in Paulding and Cherokee County started class once again today, both offering in person or virtual learning for students. Tracy A. McPeer shows us uh, what the scene was for Cherokee High School, where the majority of students opted for in person learning. Many parents in Cherokee County dropped off their kids today for the first day back like Frankie Martinez. We think about it like 10 times bringing them, but my wife, she works in school too, so she knows that he's gonna be safe. Because she works in school in Cherokee County, and um, I think we're gonna be okay. So I tell the parents to send to school, and if kids start feeling a little weird, a little bad, just take them back home. According to the district, about 78% of families are opting for in-person learning, with just under 10,000 of the district's nearly 43,000 students going completely virtual. A teacher's relative telling us he's worried about her safety and doesn't think social distancing is a realistic option. What we see on paper is simply not what's feasible to happen in the classrooms, in the hallways, in the public gathering spots. He says suggesting masks for students isn't enough. And on this first day back, he doesn't feel it's clear what happens if a student gets infected. When is the public notified? When are the teachers notified? When can that child be required to come back? At the end of the day, we saw many leaving Cherokee County High School wearing masks, doing their part to stop the spread of COVID and start back at school. If you're not sure what your school district's plans are or you just want some more information, you can text the word school to the number on your screen. We'll send you our back to school guide for Metro Atlanta District so you can stay prepared. More than 2,000 medical professionals from around the state are asking uh, the governor to step up the response to COVID-19. The healthcare workers sending a letter to Governor Kemp uh, with five specific recommendations. Our Joe Hinkey has a closer look at what they're asking for and why. Back to school season is here, and before we know it, cold and flu season will also be upon us. With that in mind, one doctor who signed the letter said the time to act and curb new COVID-19 cases is now. Level that the virus is circulating at right now with with over 3,000 cases a day um, for the last couple weeks uh, is just way too high as we enter the fall. Dr. Jonathan Colasanti, assistant professor of medicine and global health at Emory University, is one of the 2,100 plus healthcare workers, including physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants from 59 Georgia counties, to sign this letter sent to Governor Brian Kemp. We want to see the economy get back to normal as quickly as possible. We want to see kids back in school. We agree that that's the best learning environment for children. But to do so safely, Cole Asante says, as was the case in April, the curve again needs to be flattened. And the letter sent to Kemp lists five recommendations to do so. Number one, a temporary statewide face covering requirement outside the home and during outdoor activities when social distancing cannot take place. Number two, close bars and nightclubs, prohibit indoor dining and the gathering of 10 or more people, including churches. Number three, empower elected officials to put stronger requirements in place as appropriate in their areas. Number four, greatly expand both testing and contact tracing efforts and shorten the wait time for test results. And number five, take actions to eliminate the state's racial and ethnic disparities in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Don't have to go back to a lockdown, but we have to implement these common sense measures that we know that science tells us work. Um, to curb the, the circulation of the virus currently. And then they have to be, we have to maintain them, and then we have to open safely according to those um, White House Coronavirus Task Force guidelines. We have reached out to Governor Kemp's office to see if it would consider any or all of the recommendations, but so far we have not heard back. We're heading to break, but don't forget, we are streaming right now live on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. As always, you can subscribe and get in on the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. 
televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people? I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and we continue to watch the weather here locally, where we had these strong storms that rolled through earlier, and now tonight, many folks late afternoon and this evening are outside cleaning up from the damage from some of the storms that rolled through. That is now all off to the east, but we have a few showers here that are south and west of the city that are still holding on, and these are showing signs of weakening as they move over to the east. Here's a loop that actually takes us back six hours to between two and three o'clock this afternoon. Afternoon. And you can see that's the time frame when all of these storms are moving through Atlanta. Before noon, they were actually up here in northwest Georgia, up near Calhoun uh, in the Gordon County area as well. And then everything rolled through here with heavy rain, lightning. We had some large hail indicated in some of these storms, and it's all pushed off to the east, now really out beyond Athens. Now, here's a closer look. I'll go back to that. There's a closer look at these storms that are in northwest or actually southwest of us right now in Heard County, also in Troop County. A few of these may roll into a Carroll into a, a Coweta County near Noonan, but I really think those are going to be falling apart as they move to the east. And you can see the back edge of those showers and storms that came through our area earlier are now about to clear the state. They're still out I-20 toward Thompson. They'll be going toward Augusta, but then they'll move into South Carolina. All the stuff in northeast Georgia has already moved into South Carolina. We had a few lingering showers there around Lake Hartwell, but those have moved out and everything has cleared past uh, Lake Oconee, Lake Sinclair down near Milledgeville and is continuing to move away. Here's a look at those indicators and we keep getting more and more reports in from the National Weather Service from those spots that had some wind damage or either hail damage in some of these areas in Metro Atlanta here inside the perimeter. Also up near Lake Lanier, Dawson County. There's that storm damage from earlier up in Gordon County as well. Some of this back into Watkinsville area over near Oconee County. Let's take a look now at what else we're watching. Not only are we taking a look at what we see here going on locally, but also off the coast of the Carolinas. This is now Hurricane Isaias. We've been mentioning to you since the top of the hour when the 8 p.m. advisory came in, the National Hurricane Center, as expected, did uh, up this back up to a hurricane. It's been a tropical storm all day long here, and you can see that the storm is moving closer. It's about roughly 60 miles to the east of Charleston and about 60 miles to the south of Myrtle Beach. It's going to keep moving up toward the north, and you can see some of these outer bands with this right there on the South Carolina and North Carolina line. We have some tornado warnings that have been issued with that. Now, on the east side of the center of the storm and in this quadrant, this northeast quadrant that you see right here, that's where you usually have the worst winds, the better chance for severe storms around, too. The storms that moved through our area today really weren't uh, caused by any outer bands with the storm. It's actually the front that's moving through. That's what's actually helping to steer the system up along the coast as we go through the late night hours. And we do think we will have a landfall a little bit later on today. Here again is a look at the center of the storm. Still looks kind of ragged, but it is strong enough to be uh, reclassified as a hurricane with maximum sustained winds at 70 miles an hour. I want to take you out there again live because we're really getting some great video in. This is a live look from our tower cam. 
at Wrightsville Beach. That's just over the line there uh, into North Carolina, not too far off from Wilmington. And you can see the rough surf that is extending well northward from this storm and all of the rain that's starting to come down there uh, in North Carolina too. Meteorologist Samantha Moore joins us now. Sam has been looking over that latest forecast track and Sam, it's not only going to affect the Carolinas, the entire eastern seaboard needs to watch the storm. Absolutely, that frontal system that you were talking about, that's going to help direct that hurricane along its path because hurricanes, they don't steer themselves. They go into the path of least resistance and a frontal system is kind of like a valley. So it's just going to follow along the valley here that's going to lead them right up the east coast or lead it right up the east coast. So it's going to head through the Carolinas and then it's going to make its way through Virginia, then eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, just about every state. Uh, the 13 original colonies are going to be impacted by this tropical storm, now Hurricane Isaias, as it makes its way to the northeast. Now, it'll be a tropical storm shortly after making landfall. Once it hits friction, it will likely disorganize a little bit, and we're expecting it to, to be a tropical storm within a matter of hours after becoming a hurricane, which it just did at the top of the hour at 8 o'clock. So it's going to continue that movement all the way into eastern Canada, where it will likely then become extra tropical at that point. So these gusty winds, of course, is Chris was saying the strongest winds are always on the northeastern quadrant of the storm. We'll likely see some very strong winds as it moves through North Carolina and tropical storm force winds for sure. That continues into Virginia. And then we start to see the winds start to ease a bit once it makes its way into Canada, but bringing in some very heavy rain, easily some two and a half to four inches. And where you see the orange colors, that could be five, six inches here across much of northern North Carolina and into Virginia as well. So here's the way it's going to look and notice we do have a little moisture over us according to this. This is one of these long range models that broad brushes everything. But it shows that circulation going up the coast. So by the time we get to the middle of the week, we still have enough moisture for those heat of the day storms, but we're not seeing anything that is all that organized in nature. So we're going to end up seeing just that 20% chance once we get through tomorrow for our Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So the next 12 hours, for the most part, will be dry. We're watching those storms that Chris was talking about that are moving in through the south side. It's possible we could have an isolated thunderstorm or two before we all is said and done from this particular round of storms that we had today. So we may see an isolated system yet tonight or thunderstorm yet tonight. And then tomorrow, we have a 7 on the wisometer on that scale of 1 to an 11 with an being a per perfect day, a 7, with a 30% chance of those afternoon and evening storms. And they really will be in the afternoon and evening. We don't think we'll see anything to start the day tomorrow. We'll have a few clouds around, mixed with plenty of sunshine. Temperatures should be up close to 90 degrees during the heat of the day. So we'll see those temperatures starting to warm up. Uh, probably a little bit, uh, not quite as warm as we were today, but very, very, very close. So we'll end up seeing our temperatures warm up a little bit day by day as we get into the next seven. We're going to see them into the low to almost mid 90s by the time we get to the weekend with a 20% chance of showers each and every day this week. So that's typical garden variety, heat of the day storms, and we'll be able to take a breather after today's just terrific outbreak of storms with all the hail, the gusty winds, and that frequent lightning. We won't be seeing that, we don't believe, for at least the next seven days. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. A Johns Creek teenager is dealing with an unimaginable loss. Both of his parents have died from COVID-19 within days of each other. 17 year old Justin Hunter says he and his parents tested positive a week and a half ago, so all three of them quarantined. His parents symptoms got so bad they had to be admitted to Emory Hospital in, in Johns Creek. His father died July 26 and only four days later, the hospital called again to tell him his mother had also died. He is still in isolation for at least two more days, meaning he couldn't say goodbye in person. And they told me I couldn't come in to look at uh, or see them. And I was torn up. I, kn I know they're watching me from above. They're, they're the ones that's gonna give me strength to get through all of this. A heartbreaking story. Hunter is a senior in high school. He says he is still in shock. We have a link to this story on 11alive.com that will take you to a Go GoFundMe page that has been set up for the Hunter family. A local artist is making a statement through her work. This influencer and social media strategist has already made national headlines through her content on Instagram promoting racial issues and elevating the conversation. Now she's trying to help educators do the same. Here's Elwin Lopez. Even when the world isn't blowing up with horrific injustice, art speaks to people in ways that other things cannot. You might recognize Danielle Koch. Her artwork, amplifying the fight against racism, has garnered national attention, taking her from just about 700 followers on Instagram to now nearly half a million. Art invokes emotion, but activism encourages action. So when you put them both together, you're encouraging action by invoking emotion. Danielle says it started with this illustration in January of Martin Luther King Jr her first to be shared outside of her family and friends and inspiring her to keep using her art to push for much needed conversations about racial injustice and police brutality. This has always been an issue amongst our community, the black community and at large, but I feel like with this new wave of people starting to really be like, okay, this is a problem and this is something that I can help with, what can I do? My art started to serve as a starting point for them. She sees her art as leading to action. That's kind of really what I push my audience to do is to not only interact with the art, but find ways in their sphere of influence that they can make a change. She's also using Instagram's new personal fundraiser feature to donate posters of her art to 400 teachers. For the posters, not only are they um, artistic like this one, but we also have other posters that um, are educational and instructional and informative in regards to the allyship and anti-racism conversation. 
The runoff race for district attorney is heating up in Fulton County. Next, a one on one with the current district attorney, Paul Howard, about the race and the GBI investigation into accusations he misused funds. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. Take a look at the storm moving through in Oconee County earlier today. Tracy sent us this video from her home in Bishop showing the heavy rain and gusty winds out there. Let's get you back now over to Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb in the Storm Tracker Center. Chris, a lot going on tonight. Yeah, teaming up with Samantha Moore tonight. We're going to get more from her in just a moment as we, number one, track these storms that move through our area today locally that cause damage, flooding, a large hail, a lightning, and very heavy rain in some spots, and wind damage as well. All of that has moved off to the east. This is a six-hour loop that shows those storms as they were moving through around 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon through the metro Atlanta area. Before that, we had storms in parts of northwest Georgia that prompted severe uh, thunderstorm warnings as well as uh, prompt caused some damage there too. That all moved over to the east and it held together pretty well as it moved to the east. Storms were still really strong as they moved through Athens with very heavy rain and gusty winds. That's all now moving out of the area. We have a few lingering showers here south and west of the city. Uh, they are weakening in Heard County. It had some thunder and lightning with that 40 mile an hour winds just a little while ago, but now everything is falling apart there as well as in Heard County. A couple little lighter showers moving into Meriwether County, but that is going to fall apart. There's the back edge as it moves out of our state over towards South Carolina. A couple little lingering showers here. 
near Elberton. We had some of those showers also at Lake Hartwell. Those have pushed out. Lake Oconee, Lake Sinclair, you had that rain earlier. That's all pushing out as well. And then you see all those storms over to the west that are falling apart too. Now we had numerous reports of storm damage from these storms as they rolled through and we keep getting additional reports as well. All of these circles are indicators of wind damage or large hail stretching from Gordon County to Pickens County, Dawson County, around Lake Lanier, Forsyth and Hall County, Gwinnett County, North DeKalb, Central Fulton, South Fulton, Rockdale County, Oconee County. Those are the places where we have reports so far of some damage. But the good news is things are calming down. I just know a lot of folks are having to see this calmer weather, though, to get outside and to uh, clean up after some of those storms. The other big focus tonight is Isaias. Take a look at this. The storm now has been uh, has been uh, re uh, upped. Oh, there's a look at your rainfall totals from the heavy rain that we had a little bit earlier and around Norcross more than two inches of rain. We did have flash flood warnings in effect, but those have all been canceled. Now let's take a look at Isaias. It has now regained hurricane strength and is now a hurricane based on the 8 p.m. advisory that we just got in a little while ago. It is about 60 miles to the east of Charleston and about 60 miles to the south of Myrtle Beach, and it's going to be headed toward the north, most likely making landfall a little bit later on tonight up around Myrtle Beach or maybe up to there to the South Carolina, North Carolina line. Some of those outer bands up in North Carolina are causing some tornado warnings right now. Let's take a live look at this hour. This is our camera, uh, the live camera that we have at uh, Myrtle Beach. You can see some of the lights that are, are there on the beach. They're kind of hanging down in front of this camera. Looks like a lifeguard stand and the very rough surf that is coming in at Myrtle Beach right now uh, ahead of the actual eye that's going to be making landfall a little bit later on. The meteorologist Samantha Moore joins me right now. Sam, uh, we got that new update in just a little while ago, at, but just before 8 o'clock, and this storm is going to impact a lot of people. Absolutely, because it's going all the way up the East Coast into the Megalopolis and then into Nova Scotia. So it has a, a busy few days ahead on its calendar. As you said, it's strengthened to a hurricane 75 mile per hour max sustained winds. It's also picked up its pace. It's moving to the north northeast at 16 miles per hour, and it's pretty much been chugging along at around 9 miles per hour for the last few days. So it is starting to move more quickly up the coastline here. As you said, it doesn't look all that organized. It doesn't look like that classic donut shape that you would think of when you look at a hurricane. But uh, it's gotten its act enough together where now it is hurricane strength as it approaches the coastline here. And as you mentioned, some of these spiral bands have the tendency to produce uh, tornadoes. So we have a few tornado warnings here right now in North Carolina, uh, one that's in Brunswick, Columbus, and New Hanover counties, and the other, uh, and that's till 845, and the other a little bit further south in Brunswick and New Hanover until 9 o'clock. So that often happens when you get these outer bands moving in. They're friction tornadoes. Typically, their uh, EF zeros or EF ones are not typically the strongest of tornadoes, but they can still inflict a lot of damage. So we have have tropical storm warnings here in the orange color and those extend all the way up into New England. Uh, the red color there, those are hurricane warnings because uh, it is now a hurricane and hurricane force winds are possible and likely in northern South Carolina and uh, southern North Carolina. So we'll be watching for that for the next few hours, particularly before it makes landfall. So it is a Cat 1 hurricane moving to the north northeast at 16, heading on up into New England by the time we get to the middle of the week on Wednesday, bringing in tropical storm force winds to Pennsylvania, uh, in and around uh, upstate New York. They could be feeling these tropical storm force winds as this moves up the coastline. And those tropical storm force winds actually extending inland along with some very heavy rain. Some spots here could easily pick up some three to five inches of rain, especially here in Virginia and getting into eastern Pennsylvania. So coming up, we'll talk about what this is going to look like on their radar for the next few days and also what to expect from our weather after today's widespread storm activity. Chris, Sam, thank you so much. As the countdown continues for the August 11th Democratic primary runoff election, the battle's heating up 
For the Fulton County District Attorney seat, incumbent Paul Howard battling opponent Fonnie Willis, who previously worked in his office as a deputy chief prosecutor. In the June 9th primary, Willis led with 42% of the vote, followed by Howard. A third candidate, Christian Wise, has since dropped out and endorsed Howard. In an exclusive interview with 11 Live's Naima Abdullahi, Howard talks about the close race. He also addresses a GBI investigation, alleging he misused funding to supplement his salary. Thank you so much for joining us. You are running again for District Attorney of uh, Fulton County for the seventh time. Uh, you've held that position since 1997. How is this time different than previous times? I'm sure the state of the nation has changed and evolved, and our county has also changed and evolved. We've got to do something about policing in our communities. Um, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, Rashard Brooks, uh, and um, uh, they, they've triggered a nerve in our communities. And I think this election is different because I think that what people are asking us to do, since the DA is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system, is to become a, an important part of that change. You are running against uh, Fonnie Willis. She's endorsed by Atlanta Police Union and former Atlanta mayor candidate, uh, Mary Norwood. How do you guys differ from your opinion, um, and what do you think about her endorsements from the Atlanta Police Union? Mary Norwood is inviting Republicans to take Democratic ballots and to vote in this election. I, I don't think that that's appropriate for the Republicans to try to influence an election. When the police union endorses the DA, what that indicates is that the DA will not prosecute police. And uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate for people, for DAs to accept uh, endorsements or funding from police unions. And during election season, we can always expect things to surface, right? With the GBI investigation that surfaced where there was an alleged use of nonprofit funds to supplement your salary. Let's also address that. Uh, be happy to, because this happened in um, 2014, I believe. Um, I um, uh, asked the uh, chief appellate person in my office to tell me whether or not uh, I could receive a salary from the city of Atlanta, salary supplement. And finally, I met with the mayor, asking them for a salary supplement from the city of Atlanta. Uh, they agreed that it was uh, my work had justified my receiving it. So I, I don't really care about what form of investigation takes place. As long as it's truthful, I believe at the end, I would be totally exonerated because what I did is what Americans do all the time. We ask for pay raises, pay increases, and that's what I asked for. That's what the city of Atlanta sent over based upon the work that I had performed for the city. Well, tonight at 11 on Up Late on 11 Alive, Howard will discuss the Rashard Brooks case, his decision to quickly charge the officer, something that drew criticism, whether it was a political move or the best decision. And later on this week, you'll hear from candidate Fonnie Willis on our air as she discusses her campaign. Fulton County is breaking down what went wrong in Georgia's primary election and trying to fix it. Ahead in prime time, how they're switching up training for poll workers. Questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. 
Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Things are a lot quieter now compared to what we were dealing with earlier this afternoon as we are tracking those strong thunderstorms moving through Metro Atlanta, pushing over to the east, and they have now all pretty much gone uh, right there along the South Carolina line. Augusta, you're still dealing with some of that heavier rain moving through your area. This is the loop that goes back six hours, and you can see the storms as they were moving through the Atlanta area and much of North Georgia. We had some of those in West Georgia, Northwest Georgia earlier, and then it impacted East Georgia. You know, they started weakening a little bit as they move to the east of Atlanta, but they still had a lot of heavy rain in association with them, thunder and lightning and also some strong winds. Now late this evening, we've been tracking a little bit of lingering moisture from this that was causing some uh, thunderstorms coming out of Randolph County, Alabama into Heard County and also Troop County where we had some thunder and lightning and heavy rain. That's all falling apart right now. And then what you see over here uh, in the parts of Coweta County and Spalding County, Pike Lamar County, that's mainly uh, false echoes that we have from the radar site here that we often get at this time of the night. There's the back edge of that already through Thompson, Georgia. The back edge has moved through northeast Georgia. It has gotten past Lake Hartwell where they were having some showers and storms lingering there for a little while. Also on the south side, it's already past uh, Lake Sinclair, Lake Oconee, the Sparta area moving on over to the east. And again, every, I, I keep showing this because we keep getting additional uh, storm reports in from the National Weather Service and all of these circles and indicators that you see here show where we either had wind damage or some really large hail that fell uh, with these storms as the system moved on through. All right, let me take you over and show you what we're watching right now with the hurricane. Let's take a look at this on the bigger picture. The center of the storm is riding right up along the South Carolina coastline, and you did hear me correctly. Even though this has been a trop tropical storm all day long, we were expecting it to regain hurricane status tonight. It did that with the 8 p.m. advisory, and here's the center of the storm looking a little bit ragged, but it is strong enough to be a hurricane, and some of these outer bands from the storm are also causing some tornado warnings. This up around Wilmington, just right along I-40 as that moves in close to the coast uh, around Wrightsville Beach. We have a tornado warning in effect. We had another warning in effect right here. That one has gone away. That was near the South Carolina and North Carolina coast. There's Myrtle Beach. Now, you know, often when we tell you this, don't focus just on the eye of the storm and where it makes landfall because it's a rather large storm and it's affecting a lot of people bringing in that wind, rain and rough surf. But this is the center right here. It is now about 50 miles to the south of Myrtle Beach and it's moving up toward the north northeast and looks like it will make that landfall for the center of the storm 
storm around the South Carolina and North Carolina border a little bit later. Let's uh, take a live look out there right now and you can see what we're watching. This is the view from uh, the Wrightsville Beach area. It was that Myrtle Beach. I'm sorry. This is Myrtle Beach. I'm sorry. And you can see the, the wind is blowing there and the palm trees and you can also see the rough surf there on the left hand side of your screen as those winds are starting to kick up and the storm system nears. Now let's go to Samantha Moore. Uh, we have that uh, that new advisory that came in at eight with the latest forecast track and uh, Sam's going to time out when the system is going to be moving to the north. Yeah, it has picked up its pace moving at 16 miles per hour and I think it moved at nine miles per hour for the past four days. It really didn't change its pace, but it is picking up its pace as it strengthened and approaching the coast right now. And we have hurricane warnings in place in the red north of Charleston, stretching on up to Myrtle Beach and into uh, parts of North Carolina. And then we have tropical storm warnings all the way up the coast into New England. I don't know if I've ever seen them stretched all the way up the coast and some severe weather in New York. Now that is not because of Isaias, but it is because of moisture moving in from uh, the interior of Pennsylvania across New Jersey into New York. So we're going to watch it move up the coastline very briskly, and it'll likely weaken to a tropical storm as soon as it hits land. That often happens, especially if it's a weak hurricane or it's on the low end of the Category 1 scale. And then it's going to rocket up the coastline here. So by tomorrow afternoon, it is off the coast of Virginia Beach. By the time we get to Wednesday, it's all the way on up into northern New England, so New Hampshire. It could be moving through New Hampshire and Vermont, and then likely becoming an extra tropical low as it moves in towards Nova Scotia. And bringing in a lot of rain along that path as well. Three to five inches of rain possible here where you see the orange color. So that would be in through Virginia, on in through eastern Pennsylvania, and then it'll be heading on into New England as well. So this is what it's going to look like on radar as we head into tonight. It's looking pretty organized or as organized as it's going to get upon landfall. That'll be when it's at its strongest. Then it works its way into really the interior of, New, of, of North Carolina. It's not going to go across the Outer Banks. They're going to have the weaker winds in this case and they won't have as much rain as their neighbors will like in Raleigh-Durham um, and in Charlotte. They're going to see more rain than the Outer Banks will in this particular case. And then it goes on up into New England, bringing in that heavy rain there. And we're left with just a 20% chance of showers on our Wednesday and into our Thursday as we're going to be on the drier side of the storm. So we can't rule out heat of the day storms. So for tonight, just getting a little closer, we have those few showers that were in Heard County and Carroll County. This is over exaggerating it. This is one of our future radar products. But by midnight, things are all quiet and we have just a few clouds left over for tomorrow morning. So overnight, we're mostly dry. There may be a stray shower or two yet tonight, but it shouldn't amount to much. And then as we head into our Tuesday, a 7 on the ozometer on that scale of 1 to an 11, with 11 being a perfect day, a 7. We have a 30% chance of showers and storms during the afternoon and evening. Nothing really organized expected, just those pop-up kind of showers during the heat of the day. And that will amount to about a 30% chance. Temperatures in the mid to upper 80s much of the afternoon, and we should peak out right around 90 degrees by uh, the heat of the day around 5 or 6 o'clock. So uh, 90 tomorrow, 30% chance of rain, and then a 20% chance Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and into the beginning of next week will be in that normal summertime thunderstorm pattern. are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are County elections officials say they have been hard at work making adjustments to the voting process after a chaotic June primary. And a big part of that is training poll workers. Armara Siriani walks us through what's new ahead of August 11th runoff. Here at the Fulton County Elections Preparation Center, they're focused on improving the process. Everything from poll worker training to staffing and absentee ballots. So you're going to insert the car. Two to four hours. That's how long it takes to become a certified Fulton County Elections poll worker. Officials say the in-person training is both crucial and safe. We've got PPE for training. We're limiting the number of people that go to class. and Everyone's required to wear a mask. We take temperatures before people go in. It covers opening and closing procedures for each precinct, a thorough understanding of the new voting machines, and everything in between. Customer service oriented. They need to be uh, tech savvy. They need to be able to manage people. This new system has many more components to it than the previous system. So if somebody isn't savvy enough to recover from any sort of equipment issue, it makes it harder for the polling place to operate smoothly. On June 11th, Fulton County experienced high voter turnout and too many voters assigned to a single precinct. There were also equipment issues and staffing challenges due to COVID. Now each polling location will be staffed with one additional clerk and technician. Elections officials planning to launch a call center to handle absentee ballot requests. And this time around, the county is also equipped with more polling locations. We've added locations for the runoff. We're up to 174 and we are doing some things to get that number up to 220 for the presidential election. Elections officials say voters will be notified of their polling place two weeks prior to election day. And if you're interested in signing up to be a poll worker, head to 11alive.com and click on this story. We'll have a link to the Fulton County government's website. The viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. The Southeast Atlanta community lost one of its biggest advocates over the weekend. Maddie Jackson of Peoplestown died at 98 years old. Our Natisha Lance spoke with her family about all she's done for the community over more than 50 years. Well, in this neighborhood, they call my mom the mayor of Summer Hill. She was known for getting things done. No task ever too big or too small for Maddie Jackson. If you need anything done, you want anything to be done in the community, you go down and you see Maddie Jackson. The family of the Southeast Atlanta activist says she'd fought for what she believed was right since she was a child, making her first petition at the age of eight. Once she found that voice within, there was no stopping. Local leaders say she was an advisor to political and religious leaders, including former President Lyndon B. Johnson meeting with his cabinet about policies to protect the poor. In her unofficial role as mayor, she changed the face of the Summer Hill and Peoplestown neighborhoods, which led to Turner Field and the 1996 Summer Olympics. She wanted to make sure that her community had a fair opportunity as other communities. After years of fighting for others, in her 90s, she fought the city of Atlanta to keep her home from imminent domain. Hers was one of more than 20 homes located in a flood zone. With a cane in her right hand, she marched into Atlanta City Hall, demanding she and neighbors be heard. She called a spade a spade. She did not hesitate to say what she wanted to say. The city demolished dozens of homes, but Jackson was allowed to stay out of respect for her contributions to the city. In her 98 years, she became one of the architects of Atlanta's history and progression. She just was a true champion. There will never be another Maddie King, Angela Jackson. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're going to begin tonight with the aftermath of powerful storms that swept through Metro Atlanta. This video right here is from Sandy Springs, where a tree toppled onto a car, trapping someone inside. And we're told crews were able to get that person out safely. Sky Tracker capturing the damage at Aqualand Marina in Hall County. You can see the boats just ripped from the moorings and sections of the dock torn and waterlogged as well. Hall County officials say multiple docks and boats were either damaged or destroyed. But the good news here, folks, no one was hurt. And another big weather headline we are following for you tonight is Hurricane Isaias. This is a live look tonight at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, as Isaias inches closer and closer to the Carolina coast. Then it will move up the east coast. Let's get you straight to Chief Meteorologist 
Chris Holcomb tonight in the Storm Tracker Center. Chris, I understand that you are uh, pulling double duty, talking to our Facebook audience, keeping them informed as well as here on air. Yeah, we've got about 400 people on right now. That's why you see this in my ear because I'm making sure that they can hear me w as well. When I walk over to the chroma key wall, a lot of folks are interested in not only what's happening here locally with the storms that rolled through our area a little bit earlier, but also Isaias has now regained hurricane strength and it is going to be making landfall very soon along the South Carolina and North Carolina coastline. Let me break down first what we're watching here locally as things are a lot quieter now. We just have some uh, false echoes down around the radar site uh, on the south side right now. No rain falling from that right now, but this loop takes us back six hours and you can see those storms that were moving through the metro Atlanta area this afternoon. They pushed on off to the east. We had numerous severe thunderstorms with this and we have a lot of reports of damage in some spots too. Now we had some lingering showers this evening in Heard County uh, and Troop County, and those started dying out as they moved into Coweta and Meriwether County. They had some thunder and lightning with it. That was the last little bit of the rain. And then you can see the back edge of that main rain shield that goop moved out of our area, still over in Augusta, but about to move into South Carolina. Here in Northeast Georgia, we had some showers lingering in uh, around Lake Hartwell. That has now pushed away too. So much better now on the south side uh, over near Eatonton and Madison. Too. Now, all of these circles that you see here on the map, those are indicators of where we had either wind damage or large hail, and we keep getting more and more of those official reports in from the National Weather Service. Some of this uh, in Atlanta, in North DeKalb, Central Fulton, South Fulton, over in uh, Gordon County, Pickens County, Dawson County. Over Lake Lanier, we showed you some of that video of the boats that were damaged. North Gwinnett, also over in Oconee County, we had reports of some damage there too. Now, let me take you out and show you what's happening. This is the hurricane. Again, it has regained strength out in the Atlantic, just off the coast of Charleston, moving closer to Myrtle Beach. Uh, let me show you what's happening there live right now. This is our camera that we have uh, at Myrtle Beach. And you can see the wind blowing there in the palm trees, the heavy rain that's coming in. And there at the top and upper right hand part of your screen there, you can see the rough surf. I know it's getting dark. It's kind of hard to see a little bit, but we do have the rough surf and the waves that are coming in there to Myrtle Beach with all the wind that is rolling through. So here's the center of the storm again to the east of Charleston. It's about less than 60 miles to the south of Myrtle Beach. So we think we'll see the actual center of the storm making landfall in just a little while, most likely in the northern coast of South Carolina, right there at the North Carolina line. But something else I want you to see, uh, these outer bands, you know, we don't always want to focus just on the center or the eye of the storm because it's a large storm impacting a lot of people. And these outer bands are prompting tornado warnings around the Wilmington area. When these bands come in and kind of cause the friction there along the land, we can get some rotation there. And that's exactly what's happening happening with these storms. Here's Charleston, the center of the storm well to the east of Charleston. Their weather in Charleston is actually OK, but the center of the storm is really, we think, less than 50 miles away now from Myrtle Beach, and that's going to keep moving up toward the north. So here is the latest that we have from uh, the Hurricane Center with the storm. Maximum sustained winds at 85 miles an hour, so that wind speed is actually increased, or the winds in that have actually increased a little bit, and it's moving up toward the north. We think that once it moves inland in just a little while, it will lose its hurricane strength and become a tropical storm. But I want you to see here the red area you see right there. Those are the hurricane warnings for the South Carolina and North Carolina coast. The orange is where we have tropical storm warnings and those tropical storm warnings extend to the mid Atlantic region where tomorrow we think it'll still be a tropical storm there. It'll be moving past New York and up toward the north before it finally falls apart in Canada. But these tropical storm warnings extend all the way up the coast into Maine. So a lot of people are going to be impacted by the storm not just the ones who are going to be seeing the, the actual landfall of the center of the storm. So here's the eye of it right here. There's all the winds in association with it there through North Carolina, moving on up to the mid Atlantic region, very windy conditions, rough surf, uh, across the entire Atlantic seaboard as that system moves up to the north. Stay with us. I'm on Facebook live right now talking again to about 400 people. Join me there on my page. If you have any questions about this storm or about the weather that moved through our area today, I'll have more for you in our full, full forecast coming up. All right, Chris, thanks a lot. And you can check the forecast wherever you are, right there in your neighborhood, anytime with the 11 Alive app. You're going to find interactive maps and radar, as well as webcams and the 10-day outlook. And it's free to download. All right, let's talk about Decision 2020 now. A week from tomorrow, we may know the results from the primary runoff in Georgia. 
And although the state stopped sending out unsolicited absentee ballot applications, some voters are still getting applications from outside groups. But are they legit? 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into it for us. Traffic was slow at the early voting and absentee ballot drop-off box at DeKalb County's election headquarters this Monday. State data shows that absentee balloting in the August runoff has been twice as popular as early in-person voting, easily explained by the pandemic. I hadn't requested one. But you got one. I did. Stacy Goldstein says she wants to vote absentee but hadn't applied. So she was surprised by a piece of mail that she got containing an absentee ballot application, which came to her mailbox out of the blue with an Iowa return address. It just seemed weird. Um, and there was nothing official about it. So I was wondering why I received that since I didn't request it. But inside there was an absentee ballot application almost identical to the one on the Georgia Secretary of State's website. The return address was the Patriots Foundation, described on the internet as a conservative watchdog group. But the mailing envelope for the application was the legit Cobb County Election Office. That makes this mailer credible, says Gabe Sterling of the Secretary of State's office. Make sure the address is going to your county and not to that third power organization, because oftentimes what you'll see is they will say, send us the application, and then they'll take all your information and keep it for the third party, and you don't know if it's going to the actual county or not. Because the state isn't sending out unsolicited absentee ballot applications this summer, it's leaving a void for groups like the Patriots Foundation and others. Although her ballot looked legit enough, Goldstein says her five by eight inch application was almost too small to fill out. I think now I'm going to request an official ballot uh, do the request. Voters who get unofficial absentee ballot applications could go to 11alive.com where they would find a link to an official application and they could make a comparison of the two or they could just use the official application. Georgia health officials say there has been a slight drop in coronavirus case numbers from the weekend. The latest data shows that more than 2,200 new cases today and two additional deaths. However, the number of people in the hospital has gone up slightly from yesterday to more than 3,100. And right now, right now, folks, millions of potential COVID-19 vaccine doses are in production, but it's not known if they will ever be used. They're still undergoing trials, a lot of trials to prove if they are actually effective. Reveal investigator Andy Parati spoke to the director of the National Institutes of Health about the timeline to find a vaccine. Well, it is this guy that we're trying to deal with. <laughs> this is what coronavirus looks like. As head of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins is encouraged with the results of an early COVID-19 vaccine trial. And he says it's now ready for the next big step, a widespread study. And now we want to find out, does it work in the real world? Does it actually prevent disease in areas where the virus is spreading? And I'm sorry to say Atlanta is one of those. So we're counting on people in Atlanta to sign up to take part in this. To do that, the federal government needs 30,000 volunteers. Half will get a vaccine, the other half a placebo. Some Georgians are already participating. Emory University is one of two sites in the nation where it was initially tested and found safe. While the larger scale study is underway, Dr. Collins says the government is doing something it's never done before. It's manufacturing tens of millions of vaccine doses ahead of time in hopes this trial or another one will work. And of course, if the vaccine trial fails, all those doses have to be thrown away. But if it succeeds, then you don't have months of building up your manufacturing capacity before anybody can actually get the vaccine. And we expect there's gonna be a great deal of urgency about that. So government is spending billions of dollars to actually do the manufacturing now with the recognition that some of it may go to waste. Dr. Collins hopes that transparency will compel people to get a vaccine when it's ready. While public health officials are combating the virus, it's also battling disinformation about vaccines. Some recent polling shows as many as 50% of Americans are reluctant to get a vaccine.
Andy, I'm right. I'm quite troubled about that. I would say if we are going to get in this country past what has been an incredibly difficult time with a pandemic we haven't seen in 100 years, it's going to require us to get up to that level of herd immunity. That means most of the population becomes resistant to infection and the vaccine is the way to get there. Dr. Collins says black and Latino volunteers are needed for this trial. This vaccine produced by a company called Moderna is one of six under development around the world. If this trial is successful, doses could be distributed by as early as the end of the year. To learn more and sign up to be a volunteer yourself, go to this story on our 11 Alive app. Still to come, it's the first day of school for thousands of Metro students. We check in with families opting to send their kids back to class in person. And don't forget, if you'd like to take us on the go, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. And every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. What a day it has been. We still have more than 200 people on Facebook Live right now. A lot of folks interested in finding out what's happening. Number one, with the storms that rolled through our area today, we had folks asking, you know, was that a tornado? that hit up at Lake Lanier, even though the damage looks so bad, we do not have any evidence that that was a tornado. However, it does uh, look like that that was a microburst with some very strong winds that caused that damage uh, to those boats and the marinas there as well. Let me take this plug in out so y'all can see this a little bit better. Um, so let me show you what we're watching. The storms have moved through our area. Uh, they are off to the east. Uh, just a little bit of false echo activity down on the south side. Here's the back edge of those storms as the system was moving through earlier today. And y'all can see that as I put this into motion here. Hopefully this is gonna work. Oh, my clicker may not be working here. So um, here's the back edge of the storms as they moved through and they're now pushing into South Carolina and that will continue to move through. This is false echoes we see here. We had a few showers lingering in parts of Heard County and Troop County a little bit earlier. Those have now gone away. East Georgia, you're fine. You know, those showers were lingering into Athens for a while and to Lake Hartwell, but they have pushed out also around Lake Oconee and Sinclair. Everything has moved away. So we just now are getting more and more reports in from the National Weather Service. These are official reports of damage. Many of this reported by either uh, sheriff's deputies, police officers, or emergency managers that go into the uh, National Weather Service and feed in that. And you've got a lot of this damage around, wind damage and even some really large hail that moved through too. And we had some flooding issues earlier. We did have a few, three flash flood warnings in effect. One earlier was for Central Fulton another for North DeKalb, and another one for Western Gwinnett. Those were canceled early as the water started receding, uh, you know, but still more than two inches of rain fell in a very short period of time in parts of West Gwinnett, and that's what caused some of the flooding in some of those areas. Uh, here is what we're watching with the storm. This is Hurricane Isaias, and at 9 o'clock, we just got a new update in saying this now has 85 mile an hour winds. Here's a live look. This is one of our tower cams that we have. Wow, look at that rough 
surf right there. That is coming in from Myrtle Beach. You can see the pier and the very large waves that are rolling in there to Myrtle Beach as the storm, the center of the storm gets closer. They've already been dealing with a lot of wind and rain there today, but now the worst of it is about to move in closer to Myrtle Beach. And that's where, where we really think we're going to be seeing the center of the storm uh, moving in a little bit later on tonight. There you can see the eye. And again, we don't want to focus just on the center of the storm because a lot of people are affected by this. Up into North Carolina, you can see these outer bands. We did have a tornado warning, a, a couple of tornado warnings near Wilmington earlier. That is now expired. But these outer bands many times can cause rotation as the center of the storm moves through. There's the center. Doesn't really look that tight, but again, it is showing a little bit of uh, intensification. A hurricane hunter just flew into that, and that's why they gave us that update at 9 o'clock, showing uh, 85 mile an hour winds. It's probably less than 50 miles away from Myrtle Beach right now. There you see that update, 85 mile an hour winds, and the storm is moving north-northeast at 18 miles an hour. It'll move inland. Once it moves in during the overnight hours, it's going to go back down to a tropical storm, but then maintain tropical storm strength. We think even though it's over land through much of the day tomorrow as it moves up to the mid Atlantic region up to the north and east around New York, and then it finally loses those tropical characteristics once it moves into Canada. But I want you to look at this. You see that orange there? that extends over most of the Atlantic coastline. That's where we have tropical storm warnings in effect. So as I mentioned, many people are going to be impacted by this system as it moves up toward the north and also to the east. Now tomorrow for us, things are going to be getting better. You know, we had those storms that moved through the area earlier today, uh, but it's going to be a lot calmer tomorrow. We're not going with a zero rain chance, but those rain chances come down to 30% in the afternoon, still warm with a high of 90 degrees. In fact, let me show you what we're watching. There's the last of that storminess moving out tonight. We're going to be nice and quiet in the morning. We may start off with some of those morning clouds, maybe a little bit of fog in some spots, especially in those areas that had a lot of rain today that clears out. We'll have more sunshine at noon and then in the afternoon tomorrow. Not a really impressive rain chance, only a 20 to 30% chance for showers here for your Tuesday. And then as we go into Wednesday, it's going to be a dry start. And in the afternoon, about a 20% chance for a couple of those spotty showers. And I'm going to hold on to that rain chance, that low rain chance at 20% through the rest of the week with high temperatures each day in the lower 90s and with dew points in the upper 60s to lower 70s. You can never rule out a, a, a chance for an isolated shower uh, that could pop up and, and we're going to hold on to that pretty much for the rest of the week. So there you see it. 30% chance for showers here tomorrow. Uh, high temperatures up to about 90 degrees and then during the day uh, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday really throughout the rest of the extended period. We have about a 20% chance for those showers that'll be moving through high temperatures each day in the lower 90s with partly cloudy skies. Most of us will stay dry. Just be aware through the week and maybe one or two of those spotty isolated pop up showers that could develop. Symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit Students returning to two Metro Atlanta school districts today, Paulding and Cherokee counties, both offering in-person or virtual learning. So in Cherokee County, nearly 78% are opting for going back to the classroom. 11 Alive's Tracy Amick Peer describes what it was like this afternoon at Cherokee County High. The superintendent sent out an email to families calling today a success. He says every school was visited by him or his senior staff throughout the day. And what they saw were students and teachers social distancing or wearing a mask. Superintendent Brian Hightower thanked the teachers for all their hard work since last spring and recognized the challenges of virtual learning. He also acknowledged that we are all still living through a pandemic and stated they will take positive cases seriously. The superintendent also mentioned a COVID-19 status report. They will send out each week to update everyone on any new infections in the Cherokee County School District. Now, the vast majority of the district's 43,000 students are doing in-person learning, with just under 10,000 opting for digital. As we've seen in just about every district, there's no perfect solution, with families divided over in person. We think about it like 10 times bringing them, but my wife, she works in school too, so she knows that he's gonna be safe. Because she works in school in Cherokee County, and um, I think we're gonna be okay. What we see on paper is simply not what's feasible to happen in the classrooms, in the hallways, in the public gathering spots. He reminded families they will shut down classes and schools if cases rise and closures are in the best interest of the community. Now we have a link to the full letter on our website. A local artist is making a statement through her work. This influencer and social media strategist has already made national headlines through her content on Instagram promoting racial issues and elevating the conversation. Now she's trying to help educators do the same. Here's Elwin Lopez. Even when the world isn't blowing up with horrific injustice, art speaks to people in ways that other things cannot. You might recognize Danielle Koch. Her artwork, amplifying the fight against racism, has garnered national attention, taking her from just about 700 followers on Instagram to now nearly half a million. Art invokes emotion, but activism encourages action. So when you put them both together, you're encouraging action by invoking emotion. Danielle says it started with this illustration in January of Martin Luther King Jr her first to be shared outside of her family and friends and inspiring her to keep using her art to push for much needed conversations about racial injustice and police brutality. This has always been an issue amongst our community, the black community and at large, but I feel like with this new wave of people starting to really be like, okay, this is a problem and this is something that I can help with. What can I do? My art started to serve as a starting point for them. She sees her art as leading to action. That's kind of really what I push my audience to do is to not only interact with the art, but find ways in their sphere of influence that they can make a change. She's also using Instagram's new personal fundraiser feature to donate posters of her art to 400 teachers. For the posters, not only are they um, artistic like this one, but we also have other posters that um, are educational and instructional and informative in regards to the allyship and anti-racism conversation. The runoff race for district attorney is heating up in Fulton County next. The one-on-one -on -one with the current DA, Paul Howard, about the race and the GBI investigation into accusations he misused funds.
We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We continue to watch here locally those storms that are moving out. The rain is fading apart, even though you see some green here. Uh, those are the uh, false echoes that we have around the radar site that often happen at this time of night. This six hour loop shows those storms that rolled through Atlanta a little bit earlier with heavy rain, really strong winds, large hail, a lot of lightning uh, that has now moved out and it's over into South Carolina. Then we had a few lingering showers here in Heard County and Troop County. Those fell apart as they moved over to the east. And here you see the back edge of the rain that is moving out even from Augusta right now. They had some thunder and lightning a little bit earlier, but now that's all dying out as it pushes over into South Carolina. We're still getting in new reports of damage. All of these indicators that you see here on your screen through Dawson County, Forsyth, Hall County, uh, North Gwinnett County, Central Fulton, North DeKalb, South DeKalb, Rockdale, uh, Pickens, Gordon County, also back into Alabama. That's where we have reports of, uh, of wind damage and also some large hail that came through. Now now, let me show you what we're watching. This is Hurricane Isaias at 9 o'clock. We got a new update in from the National Hurricane Center saying this is now has winds of 85 miles an hour and it's nearing the coastline. Take a look out there at what we're watching. This is a live view. This is a tower cam in Myrtle Beach right now as we're looking at that pier. I know it's getting kind of dark, but you can see the light there at the pier reflecting on the water and the really uh, high waves that are moving in with the rough surf that's moving in to the south. Carolina coastline as well as the North Carolina coastline too. Here is a closer look at the storm as we're watching the center of it now uh, really close to Myrtle Beach and again we're watching for number one a landfall 
uh, which lets us know when this system moves inland because that's when it's going to start weakening a little bit. But we also don't want to focus just on the center of the storm because it's affecting a lot of people. Look at these rain bands coming into North Carolina. We had a couple of tornado warnings near Wilmington a little bit earlier, and that continues to move up toward the north. Here's a closer look at the center of the storm. It's now well to the north and west of Charleston, just south of Myrtle Beach, and it's about to make landfall. It's less than 50 miles away. I'm going to have to update that uh, in just a minute here. At the center of the storm, continues to move northward where we have that hurricane warning in effect for the South Carolina and North Carolina coast. But look at this. It goes back down to a tropical storm when it moves inland during the overnight hours, but it maintains tropical storm strength even in overland during the day tomorrow. That's why we have these tropical storm warnings in effect along the coastal region. And those tropical storm warnings extend up into the main area. And that's when the storm will finally move back down and lose its tropical characteristics when it makes it up into Canada. So a lot of people are going to be impacted by the storm. We'll talk more about that and what we can expect on the back side of the system as we go through the rest of the week. More on that coming up. As the countdown continues for the August 11th Democratic primary runoff election, the battle heats up for the Fulton County District Attorney seat. Incumbent Paul Howard is battling opponent Fannie Willis, who previously worked in his office as a deputy chief prosecutor. In an exclusive interview with 11 Alive's Naima Abdullahi, Howard talks about the close race. He also addresses his decision to charge the officers in the Rayshard Brooks case and also opens up about a GBI investigation that believes he'll be exonerated from. Thank you so much for joining us. You are running again for district attorney of uh, Fulton County for the seventh time. Uh, you've held that position since 1997. How is this time different than previous times? I'm sure the state of the nation has changed and evolved, and our county has also changed and evolved. We've got to do something about policing in our communities. Um, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, Rayshard Brooks, uh, and um, uh, they, they've triggered a nerve in our communities. And I think this election is different because I think that what people are asking us to do, since the DA is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system, is to become a, an important part of that change. You are running against uh, Fani Willis. She's endorsed by Atlanta Police Union and former Atlanta mayor candidate, uh, Mary Norwood. How do you guys differ from your opinion, um, and what do you think about her endorsements from the Atlanta Police Union? Mary Norwood is inviting Republicans to take Democratic ballots and to vote in this election. I, I don't think that that's appropriate for the Republicans to try to influence an election. When the police union endorses the DA, what that indicates is that the DA will not prosecute policemen. And uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate for people, for DAs, to accept uh, endorsements or funding from police unions. And during election season, we can always expect things to surface, right? With the GBI investigation that surfaced where there was an alleged use of nonprofit funds to supplement your salary, let's also address that. Uh, be happy to, because this happened in um, 2014, I believe. Um, I um, uh, asked the uh, chief appellate person in my office to tell me whether or not uh, I could receive a salary from the city of Atlanta, salary supplement. And finally, I met with the mayor, asking them for a salary supplement from the city of Atlanta. Uh, they agreed that it was uh, my work had justified my receiving it. So I, I don't really care about what form of investigation takes place. As long as it's truthful, I believe at the end, I, I would be totally exonerated because what I did is what Americans do all the time. We ask for pay raises, pay increases, and that's what I asked for. That's what the city of Atlanta sent over based upon the work that I had performed for the city. As we talk about the cries for justice that we heard nationwide and here in Metro Atlanta with the case of uh, Rayshard Brooks, um, when you listed the charges against the officers, did you think that there would be criticism for how fast you moved on the case? 
Um, and that is one criticism that we saw, you know, is there political interest? Why is he so quick to charge these officers? How do you respond to those who may think that way about what you did? Well, uh, the first time that uh, I uh, presented charges against an officer was way back in 2002. And let me tell you, I received the very same complaints, uh, rushed the judgment that what I was doing was political. And that has been the criticism that we've received on every occasion. So I expected that to happen. Do you believe police reform is necessary in the city of Atlanta? And what would that look like? The, the reform has to take place. Uh, I, I don't believe that this generation is going to be as tolerant as some other generations. Uh, and the first thing I think we have to do is to realize we've got a problem. What can you promise in your next term to make sure that there is not another Kane Rogers, not another DeAndre Phillips, not another Rayshard, not another Demarion? We can go on and on with that list, right? So the cases that you mentioned, those are all cases in Atlanta, cases where there is no body cam, no, no dash cam. So that means the DA, in my position, we are fighting and struggling to recreate the crime scenes. How can we make sure we enforce officers turn on the body cameras? You know, what kind of discipline is needed? What kind of structure is needed? I just think it's ridiculous that, for instance, when we look at the Rashad Brooks case, during the struggle, the body cams were on. But it was only after the struggle, when the shooting took place, that the body cams are off. It can be changed uh, very quickly uh, by uh, by exerting some disciplinary measures, strong disciplinary measures, people are demanding that our criminal justice system act in the appropriate way, creating one system of justice. And, and I just appreciate the opportunity to get a chance to discuss those matters with you. And what do you say to voters who say, okay, he's running for a seventh time, maybe we do need new energy? Well, I would ask them to look very carefully at both candidates, uh, because when I started in 97, our main problem at that time was our violence rate. You know, we had 187 homicides per year taking place in Atlanta. And what the citizens said is, we need this leadership and energy to reduce the number. That's what I've done, reduced it by 70%. So what, what I say is we, we've got some, now some important changes to make with respect to police reform. You need to put someone in office who is experienced in making big changes. If you look at my opponent and you look at her record, never been involved or created a criminal justice pro crime prevention program at all. Never done that in her career. So I think this is too, the, the issue is too important. The time is too important. Um, you know, I, I don't think the fact that you've been in office expresses a lack of energy because I have it. Uh, I've got the focus. Um, you know, I don't think anybody would say, well, you know, John Lewis has been in office too long. He, he's been in office because he has kept fighting for what is right. And that's what we've been doing in the DA's office in Fulton County. And how is it like running a campaign during quarantine? I'm sure you can't see the people like you normally would. Uh, how have you been able to readjust in a way where you're reaching them on a virtual level? Because, you know, obviously for coronavirus reasons, I'm sure it's harder to reach communities the way you normally would have. Well, it's been really tough. It's been really tough uh, meeting people, uh, some of the normal places that... Um, that I would show up as a candidate, you know, at churches and at organizational meetings, there aren't meetings going on like that. So uh, that's been really tough. The other thing that's been tough is um, talking to my friends and associates, uh, particularly uh, those in business. Uh, a lot of the people that I talk to that I would normally get uh, donations from, uh, I have said that sometimes when the conversation is over with, I feel like my campaign ought to donate money to them rather than the other way around uh, because they've really experienced some re really hard circumstances because of the virus. It, it's really difficult to figure out what to do next. Uh, for instance, um, we would like to propose some get-out-the-vote activities in the city of Atlanta. 
but we know there are some guidelines that have been acted by the mayor uh, and the governor. So it's, very, it's a very difficult atmosphere. What kind of access do you hope to give to those communities so that they always feel like they have a voice in this city? One of the great parts of this election is getting a chance to kind of rediscuss issues with our citizens and particularly our young people uh, because of all of the things that we display ourselves as in the city of Atlanta, uh, it is obvious we've got a large segment of our community that feels totally left out. Uh, they, they don't feel like their thoughts and their desires are being considered. They don't feel like they're at the table to make any decisions at all. And so many feel that the only chance they, they get a chance to display it is in a march. Well, I, I listen, and, and I'm going to be sure that uh, that never happens with respect to the DA's office. So one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to be setting up monthly communication meetings or meetings with that same younger feeling neglected group so we can listen to them so they can see what is going on in the DA's office because what I've tried to convey is I'm their DA. I'm elected to help them. I'm not elected to help me, but I'm elected to help them. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anything I didn't ask that you'd like to also share? I feel like we kind of hit everything and we were able to have an in-depth conversation. Well, I think we did, and, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I just want people uh, to understand how serious it is uh, that we make these changes. Postal workers and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you 
First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal... I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We continue to track these storms, not only that came through our area earlier today that have moved out. We're a lot quieter out there right now, but we're also watching what is happening with Hurricane Isaias, which is off the coast. Now, this is just false echoes on the south side. We don't have any rain there. I'm going to clear that up for you coming up in just a little bit. But here's a look at those storms that rolled through our area earlier today with very heavy rain, thunder, lightning, damaging wind. Some of that wind caused some damage in some spots. We had some some lingering showers there in uh, West Georgia and then East Georgia. All the showers are finally moving out of Augusta. You can see here all these indicators show where we had reports of some hail or wind damage earlier from those storms that moved through our area. Now we're also watching what is happening with Isaias and the center of the storm now is getting closer and closer to the uh, North Carolina and South Carolina coast as far as the center of the storm. But the storm itself with rain and wind is impacting a lot of people already into South Carolina and North Carolina with some of these bands that are moving through. Here's a live look at what we're watching with those storms. Uh, this is in Myrtle Beach as we're looking at the pier there and you can see that really rough surf that is coming in there along the coast. That's there at South. Wow, look at that breaking wave right there. Just about to slam that pier. Look at that. Um, that is some, those are some crazy waves that are coming in right now. Very powerful system that continues to move closer to the South Carolina coastline. Let's watch this one break right there as it's coming in right there at the pier and another one about to break right there too. So very active, rough surf there along the South Carolina coastline. And that's confirming what we're seeing here on radar with the center of the storm that continues to move closer. We were just looking at the live camera at Myrtle Beach, and that's right where we have the worst of that storm there. And that eye wall there on the west side is that eye wall showing where we have those stronger storms that are moving through. And then also on the east side, we have these rain bands that are feeding in to North Carolina. We're about to see a landfall. The center of the storm still just off the coast there as it continues moving. Again, I'm going to have to update this uh, the, that marker right there indicating less than 50 miles off the coast. The winds have come up. Now, just know at 8 o'clock, the National Hurricane Center upgraded this from a tropical storm to a hurricane, saying it had 75 mile an hour winds. Then at 9 o'clock tonight, they upped it to 85 mile an hour winds as they got some new data in from a Hurricane Hunter airplane that was in the storm. So this is a, a, a definite hurricane. It's holding together. We do think it'll come back down to tropical storm strength overnight tonight as the system moves inland and that kind of loses its fuel source of that warm water. And so it weakens. But then it will maintain tropical storm strength through the afternoon hours tomorrow uh, as it goes through the mid-Atlantic region up toward New York. And even with those storms there in the New England area uh, with tropical storm force winds there at 50 mile an hour winds early on Wednesday morning before it finally loses that tropical status there. So because of that, as it's traveling up the coastline, see the orange there that goes all the way up to coast to Maine? That's where we have tropical storm warnings in effect. And many of those places along the Atlantic coast Line will be seeing those tropical storm force winds moving in. Our weather is actually going to improve tomorrow. The rain chance doesn't totally go away, but it's going to be a lot lower than what we had out there for today. We'll get up to 90 degrees, a 7 on the wasometer, a 30% chance for some showers redeveloping though during the day tomorrow. It's a lot quieter out there right now, calmer. I had a lot of folks on Facebook Live saying, hey, it's really a nice evening out there. Uh, that's after those storms have moved on through. Now tomorrow we start off with a few clouds, some morning type clouds, maybe a little bit of fog, especially in those spots that saw a lot of rain today with that higher moisture content uh, in the air in the morning. Then at noontime tomorrow, more sunshine. And in the afternoon tomorrow, we will see a mixture of sunshine and clouds, only a 30% chance for showers that'll be developing in the afternoon tomorrow. And then on Wednesday, it's gonna be a dry, sunny start. And really, as we go through the rest of the week, we're gonna see most dry days with only a chance for a few of those scattered showers that'll pop up in the afternoons and evening hours. Here is a look at what we're watching uh, with the bigger picture. There's the uh, European model taking that storm away. Still on the back side, we'll have mainly drier weather moving in with this, but each and every day when you have temperatures in the lower 90s and a little bit of moisture at the surface with dew points in the upper 60s and lower 70s. You can't rule out a scattered shower, so we're going to hold on to a 20% chance for showers as we go through the end of the week into the weekend and uh, 
still some of those isolated showers that we'll have around. Here's a look at that forecast. You can see what we're talking about tomorrow. 30% chance for showers. Then we're down to a 20% chance once we get into Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, and also each day with that 20% chance for showers. We're going to be dealing with some of those uh, isolated showers that 20% chance and high temperatures each day. That'll make it up into the lower 90s for the rest of the period. The Southeast Atlanta community lost one of its biggest advocates over the weekend. Maddie Jackson of Peoplestown died at 98 years old. Natisha Lands talked with her family about all she's done for the community over more than 50 years. Well, in this neighborhood, they call my mom the mayor of Summer Hill. She was known for getting things done. No task ever too big or too small for Maddie Jackson. If you need anything done, you want anything to be done in the community, you go down and you see Maddie Jackson. The family of the Southeast Atlanta activist says she'd fought for what she believed was right since she was a child, making her first petition at the age of eight. Once she found that voice within, there were no stopping. Local leaders say she was an advisor to political and religious leaders, including former President Lyndon B. Johnson, meeting with his cabinet about policies to protect the poor. In her unofficial role as mayor, she changed the face of the Summer Hill and Peoplestown neighborhoods, which led to Turner Field and the 1996 Summer Olympics. She wanted to make sure that her community had a fair opportunity as other communities. After years of fighting for others, in her 90s, she fought the city of Atlanta to keep her home from imminent domain. Hers was one of more than 20 homes located in a flood zone. With a cane in her right hand, she marched into Atlanta City Hall, demanding she and neighbors be heard. She called a spade a spade. She did not hesitate to say what she wanted to say. The city demolished dozens of homes, but Jackson was allowed to stay out of respect for her contributions to the city. In her 98 years, she became one of the architects of Atlanta's history and progression. She just was a true champion. There will never be another Maddie King, Angela Jackson. Jackson's family says they find it fitting that she would pass so close to her friend C.T. Vivian and Congressman John Lewis, all of them warriors of change. We'll be right back. Biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's big well, we could all use a little positivity these days, right? And a colorful mystery as folks talking in Forsyth County. And here's why. The sheriff's office has been painting rocks for a little game of hide and seek. Deputies began hiding the rocks last month around the county. Some of them have cartoons, animals, or even insects on them. Uh, but they all have one thing in common here, folks. A message of kindness written on the back. The sheriff's office is asking if you find one, Post a picture and use the hashtag FCSO rocks. And we have a drying out conditions out there tonight as those storms have moved to the east. We're going to have about a 30% chance for scattered showers to redevelop tomorrow afternoon and high temperatures around 90. The rain chance is a lot lower tomorrow than what we had today. Then a 20% chance for showers Wednesday through Monday next week with high temperatures each day in the lower 90s. All right, stick around. Chris is still tracking storms. We'll see you here ahead on primetime at 10 and on 11 Alive for up late at 11. Good night. On WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Right now at 10, we are tracking Hurricane Isaias as it continues to gain strength, the impact it could have here 
on Georgia. And questions about the policies in place to keep students and staff safe as kids head back to school during the pandemic. Plus, thousands of medical professionals are asking for more COVID-19 precautions from the governor. A list of their five recommendations. But first tonight, let's get you back out live with that look at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Tonight, you see the rain really covering the lens, but off in the distance, if you saw our live view at the top of the show, you could see just how powerful those winds were and that water ripping onto the shore there as Hurricane Isaias gains strength tonight. You can see just how strong the winds are making those large waves. If it wasn't for all of that rain covering the camera lens there, well, this is a better view of what's going on. Hurricane Isaias is expected to make landfall on the coast of the Carolinas very soon. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb in the Storm Tracker Center for us tonight monitoring it all. Chris, how is this going to impact Georgia? Well, thank goodness it's not going to really have any impact on us as it pulls away. A lot of people were asking me if the storms that we had today were part of the outer bands from that system. Nope, our storms today were from a cold front coming in and we had some indirect impacts from East IES just from the additional moisture that was coming in from the east. But the storms that we had here today were really strong with some uh, damaging wind, lightning, large hail with them and that is all now pushing off to the east and we're a lot quieter out there right now with just a few lingering showers over into parts of South Carolina. We had a few showers here south and west of us late this evening. Those have all fallen apart, so we are in a drying out process. Now look at all these indicators right here. These circles that you see showing where we had some wind damage today or even some really large hail and that covered a lot of areas today uh, with a lot of that damage that was up around Lake Lanier at one of the marinas, the Aqualand Marina. Let me show you what we're watching though there's more than what's happening here locally. Let's take a look at the bigger picture and you can see here as we go out to the coast just off the coast of South Carolina. That's where you see the center of the storm. This is Isaias. It was upgraded back to a hurricane tonight and the latest that we just got in from the National Hurricane Center is that the winds are now up to 85 miles an hour. Don't focus just on the center, but a lot of times we look at this to see when it's making landfall and we expect that in just a little while, but it's impacting a lot of people through the Carolinas, even a tornado warning in these outer bands that are moving through uh, Wilmington right now in parts of North Carolina. We think the center of the storm, if it's analyzed right here, is less than 30 miles away from the northern coast here of uh, North of South Carolina, and it's going to be making that landfall. We think right there in the northern parts of South Carolina and right there at that line there of North Carolina too, as we go through the rest of the evening hours. Again, maximum sustained winds 85 miles an hour, and don't focus just on the center because it's going to affect a lot of people. Still, as a tropical storm overnight inland, and then moving up into the mid Atlantic region, still as a tropical storm tomorrow afternoon and even still a tropical storm up near the Boston area as it moves up on Wednesday night before it finally loses its strength and almost the entire Atlantic seaboard has tropical storm warnings in effect. Stay with us. We'll look at that wind field and let you know what happens after the system finally moves out of the area. All right, Chris, thank you. We'll see you soon. We are tracking the path of Hurricane Isaias on the 11 Alive app for you. You can download it for free right now and also get weather alerts sent right to your phone. All right, it's back to school time. Paulton County students went back to school today into the classrooms where face masks and social distancing are encouraged but not required. And even some students who want to stay away and study online at home were required to show up in school anyway, despite their objections. John Sherrick is on the story for us tonight. I just think it's outrageous. LaShondra Hambrick and her sister, parents of four students in the Paulding County Schools. The parents outrage, they say, that from what they can see, too many students and teachers are not wearing masks and not social distancing. And there's no requirement that they do either one. No requirement even after the principal of North Paulding High School sent a letter to parents telling them that members of the football team had tested positive and that their children may also have been exposed. Hambrick and her sister signed up their children for at-home online learning but there is a waiting list for that. You don't want them to be in the classroom. I do not. And yet, what are they telling you? They're telling me as we're on the waiting list, we're highly encouraged to come to school. And if you don't, then what? 
I was told that um, if my daughter wasn't there today, she would be withdrawn. A school system spokesperson confirms that students on the waiting list for the online learning are required to be in school in the meantime. As it is, 30% of Paulding County school parents opted for at-home online learning, but there was no information available about how many of them are on the waiting list. It's very frustrating and unsettling. Dr. Frida Fisher is a pediatrician in Atlanta who believes that all school systems should require masks and social distancing. We all want children to be in school. We understand that they need to be face-to-face -face for the best learning. And so it's upsetting because we are sending our kids to school knowing that we are putting them at an increased risk for spreading coronavirus among themselves and to the community. Paulding County's school superintendent did not comment, but did release a statement to parents saying that on this first day of school, the employees he saw were wearing masks and he encouraged more widespread use in the schools. So we asked our numbers team to take a closer look at the overall COVID cases in the metro Atlanta counties that went back to school today. While the overall number of COVID cases in Paulding County are low, the county did post 58 new positive cases on Saturday, its highest number to date. In all, Paulding has had 1,452 COVID cases. 121 of those have gone to the hospital for care and 19 people have died. After hitting a record high last week, Cherokee is still reporting twice as many new cases each day right now than in the first wave of the pandemic. To date, Cherokee has had 2,885 positive cases, 294 have sought medical care, and 56 people have died. As for the state's numbers as a whole, we continue to trek downward. Today, about 2,200 new cases were reported. That is a break from the record highs we were experiencing about a week ago. Overall, that's good news with more districts heading back this week. New tonight in Georgia, Congressman meets with North Georgia educators to talk about opening schools safely. Representative Doug Collins and his wife Lisa, a former Hall County teacher, met with superintendents, principals and teachers. The goal there to make sure students can go to class in person while protecting everyone. So we want to get this uh, started. We want to get the classes, but we want to do it safely and respectfully for the teachers and for the administrators and for the staff that come around because it's, it's, it's a multi-generational issue. Collins wanted to hear from the local educators to see what message he could bring to the federal level and give them the help they need to reopen the schools. Collins, of course, is also running for a U.S. Senate seat. If you're not sure what your school district's plans are or you want to know more, text SCHOOL to the number you see there on your screen. That's where we'll send you our back to school guide for Metro Atlanta districts so you can be prepared. An urgent call for more than 2,000 healthcare workers, ER doctors to epidemiologists are speaking from the front lines, literally begging Governor Kemp to get tougher in fighting the COVID-19 crisis. Natisha Lands has a breakdown on some of those recommendations. This is not where anyone in public health and in healthcare in general would have wanted or expected the United States of America to be five months after a pandemic. Georgia's curve is not flat yet. It's been on the rise for weeks, creating a big concern among healthcare workers. The level that the virus is circulating at right now with, with over 3,000 cases a day um, for the last couple weeks. Uh, is just way too high as we enter the fall. Dr. Jonathan Colasanti is one of more than 2,100 healthcare workers to sign this letter sent to Governor Brian Kemp. It's the second one directed toward the governor in a month. It's a call for help from the front lines, asking the state to implement five recommendations to help protect Georgians from the virus. We are far from uh, controlling uh, or managing appropriately this pandemic. Dr. Edward Espinoza says he tests 15 to 20 COVID patients a day at his private practice in Buckhead. He wasn't part of the group that sent the letter to the governor, but he supports it. Some of the temporary recommendations include requiring a temporary statewide face covering outside the home and empowering elected officials to put stronger requirements in place as appropriate in their areas. The areas where we're seeing the high positivity rates is really where we need to focus on. Right now, Cobb, DeKalb, and Fulton counties have the most confirmed cases in the state. That's according to the Department of Health. Several cities have mask mandates, but Governor Kemp has spoken out against it. He says it cannot be enforced. New tonight at 10, newly leaked body cam video shows the moments leading up to George Floyd's deadly arrest by Minneapolis police. 
This is one image from the leaked video that was posted by the Daily Mail today. You can see Floyd on the ground after he was handcuffed. We are not showing the body cam video because it is just simply too graphic and quite disturbing. It shows an officer almost immediately pulling his weapon on Floyd before struggling with police in the back of a patrol car. The source of the leaked video is still unclear. It does match what was shown to NBC News during a pretrial hearing for the four officers charged in the case. Officers were initially called to a convenience store back in May in Minneapolis to investigate a possible counterfeit bill. Officers arrested Floyd over the fake money. Former officer Derek Chauvin pressed his knee into Floyd's neck during that arrest for nearly nine minutes, killing him. Chauvin is charged with second degree murder. Three other arresting officers are charged with aiding and abetting murder. A week from tomorrow, we could know the results from the primary runoff in Georgia. And although the state stopped sending out unsolicited absentee ballot applications, some voters are still getting applications from outside groups. But are they legit? 11 Alive's Doug Richards is looking into it. Traffic was slow at the early voting and absentee ballot drop-off box at DeKalb County's election headquarters this Monday. State data shows that absentee balloting in the August runoff has been twice as popular as early in-person voting, easily explained by the pandemic. I hadn't requested one. But you got one. I did. Stacy Goldstein says she wants to vote absentee but hadn't applied. So she was surprised by a piece of mail that she got containing an absentee ballot application, which came to her mailbox out of the blue with an Iowa return address. It just seems weird. Um, and there was nothing official about it. So I was wondering why I received that since I didn't request it. But inside, there was an absentee ballot application almost identical to the one on the Georgia Secretary of State's website. The return address was the Patriots Foundation, described on the Internet as a conservative watchdog group. But the mailing envelope for the application was the legit Cobb County Election Office. That makes this mailer credible, says Gabe Sterling of the Secretary of State's office. Make sure the address is going to your county and not to that third party organization, because oftentimes what you'll see is they will say, send us the application and then they'll take all your information and keep it for the third party, and you don't know if it's going to the actual county or not. Because the state isn't sending out unsolicited absentee ballot applications this summer, it's leaving a void for groups like the Patriots Foundation and others. Although her ballot looked legit enough, Goldstein says her 5 by 8 inch application was almost too small to fill out. I think now I'm going to request an official ballot, uh, do the request. Voters who get unofficial absentee ballot applications could go to 11alive.com where they would find a link to an official application and they could make a comparison of the two or they could just use the official application. A Georgia teenager couldn't even say goodbye to his parents who both died because of COVID-19 next. How he's doing in isolation right now and what you can do to help out. And in the next half hour, a one-on-one -on -one with Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard about the DA runoff race and the GBI investigation into accusations he misused funds. Yeah. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
This next story just rips your heart out. A Johns Creek teenager is dealing with an unimaginable loss after both of his parents died of COVID-19 within days of each other. 17 year old Justin Hunter says he and his parents all tested positive a week and a half ago, so all three of them quarantined. His parents symptoms got so bad they had to go to the hospital at uh, Emory there in Johns Creek. His father died on July 26. Only four days later, the hospital called again to tell him his mother also died. He is still in isolation for at least two more days, meaning he could not say goodbye in person. And they told me I couldn't come in to look at uh, or see them. And I was torn up. I know, I know they're watching me from above. They're, they're the ones that's going to give me strength to get through all of this. You may see a glimpse of a smile on his face during that interview there. So we do have a link for you inside this story on 11alive.com that will take you to a GoFundMe page for the Hunter family. Things are a lot calmer here in Metro Atlanta and North Georgia now as those storms that rolled through our area earlier have finally moved out of the state and they're over into South Carolina. And now this rain and the storms that we had today, those were in association with an actual front that's trying to push into North Georgia. This isn't really an outer band or anything that was in association with Isaias. It's because of the front. Now Isaias may have enhanced some of the moisture coming in up ahead of that front, but it was really indirect impacts from the tropical system that's off the coast of South and North Carolina. There you see the back edge of the rain moving through with all that thunder and lightning finally getting out of our state. And then later in the evening, we had a few lingering showers here in Heard and Troop County uh, that had some thunder and lightning with them. And then those have all fallen apart. So things are a lot quieter out there right now. But as it got quiet today and as those storms moved out, a lot of folks had to go outside to clean up the damage, wind damage that we had reported around and all of these indicators that you see right here. These are the official reports that we have from the National uh, Weather Service in Peachtree City. Also, many areas reported some large hail uh, scattered around with those storms that came through too. Now our focus is on Isaias, which is now again a hurricane. We mentioned earlier in the 8 o'clock advisory, it was upgraded again to a hurricane. Then at 9 o'clock, uh, the National Hurricane Center saying it now has 85 mile an hour winds and it is nearing the coast, making the landfall right there with the center of the storm. Let's take a look at the bigger picture and you can get a good look at what we're watching here. And I'll zoom in a little bit tighter. There you see the center of the storm right now getting ready to make landfall uh, at the South Carolina and the North Carolina coast. Now the, the center of the storm right now we think is about really less than 27 miles off of the coast right now as this has moved up just a little bit more. And we think that actual landfall is going to be right there at the South Carolina and North Carolina line. But as we tell, tell you many times with these storms, don't focus just on the eye. Now, of course, the eye or the center of the storm is very important because as it moves inland, it is going to weaken. But as you can see there, I'm going to go back to that, that these outer bands are causing a lot of rain coming into the North Carolina coast. And we've even had numerous tornado warnings there along the coast too in some of those bands. We have that one right now uh, just to the west of Wilmington with that tornado warning that is in effect. So here's a look at what we're watching. The latest from the Hurricane Center. Maximum sustained winds at 85 miles an hour, moving north northeast at 18 miles an hour. That's moving very quickly. Landfall is at any time right now, right there at the South Carolina, North Carolina line. In the overnight hours, as it moves inland, it's going to lose its fuel source of the warm water and as it's over land, we expect it to weaken. It'll be a tropical storm at two in the morning. Still, we think with 70 mile an hour winds and it looks like it's going to maintain the tropical storm status on up into the mid Atlantic region uh, during the day tomorrow and then on up past New York and finally losing its tropical characteristics when it moves up into Canada. So what's interesting here is remember I said don't focus just on the center of the storm because it's going to affect a lot of people. We have tropical storm warnings in effect from Maine all the way down into the Carolinas. So as it moves up to the north, it's going to be impacting a lot of people. Tomorrow for us, we're actually going to see some drier air moving in. We'll go see our rain chance go down to 30% with high temperatures near 90 degrees and a 7 on the wasometer. In the afternoon tomorrow, 
there's just a chance for a few scattered showers with highs near 90 and then a 20% chance for Wednesday with a high of 91. And we're going to hold on to that 20% chance for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Really low rain chances, just that typical summertime variety of a couple of pop up showers as high temperatures each day we think will make it into the lower 90s. Take a look at your weather. Wow, this is from Charles Gardner in Buckhead. Just a simple creek there that started overflowing with all the rain that we had today and made it look like some rapids going through there. That was in Buckhead. Charles is one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers. You can be one too on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive storm trackers. Ask to become a member of that closed group. We'll approve you and you can also see what other storm trackers are posting in their area and you can post your own videos, pictures and weather information there too. Up next, she uses her art to fight racism by starting a conversation, and she's hoping to spread her message into Georgia's schools. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. artist is making a statement through her work. This influencer and social media strategist has already made national headlines through her content on Instagram, promoting racial issues and elevating the conversation. Now she's trying to help educators do the same. Here's Ellen Lopez. Even when the world isn't blowing up with horrific injustice, art speaks to people in ways that other things cannot. You might recognize Danielle Koch. Her artwork, amplifying the fight against racism, has garnered national attention, taking her from just about 700 followers on Instagram to now nearly half a million. Art invokes emotion, but activism encourages action. So when you put them both together, you're encouraging action by invoking emotion. Danielle says it started with this illustration in January of Martin Luther King Jr her first to be shared outside of her family and friends and inspiring her to keep using her art to push for much needed conversations about racial injustice and police brutality. This has always been an issue amongst our community, the black community and at large, but I feel like with this new wave of people starting to really be like, okay, this is a problem and this is something that I can help with, what can I do? My art started to serve as 
a starting point for them. She sees her art as leading to action. That's kind of really what I push my audience to do is to not only interact with the art, but find ways in their sphere of influence that they can make a change. She's also using Instagram's new personal fundraiser feature to donate posters of her art to 400 teachers. For the posters, not only are they um, artistic like this one, but we also have other posters that um, are educational and instructional and informative in regards to the allyship and anti-racism conversation. And we get emails every day from people who still haven't gotten their unemployment and say they can't get any answers from the Georgia Department of Labor. Now lawmakers are putting the pressure on. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Coronavirus has left millions without jobs all across the country, and we get dozens of emails every day from people saying that their unemployment benefits are still pending and they can't reach anyone to get answers. Some people have been waiting for months now. I cannot afford my medication. I'm balancing my medication to pay my mortgage. As you pay me sometime, and then some weeks you don't pay me. So it's bounced up in the air for me. 
Today, state lawmakers are amplifying their complaints by holding a week of press conferences to get the attention of the Georgia Labor Department. Christy Diaz was listening in on one of those first calls this morning. A group of seven Georgia legislators stood together to call out the Georgia Department of Labor Commissioner Mark Butler. Mark Butler, we are calling on you to do the right thing. Process those claims. Amen. They stood outside the Clayton Career Center to ask for four things. An extension to the moratorium on evictions and utilities. Priority access to process the backlog. A call center for customer service questions that are not being addressed. And newly trained and hired staff to resolve claims over 30 days. Here's State Rep Rhonda Burno. People are desperate. They don't have any money. They're facing eviction. Since the $600 unemployment boost has expired and the moratoriums on evictions and utilities utilities lifted. The group says this money is critical for families to live, especially with school starting this month. This is unacceptable. unacceptable. It is unacceptable. inhumane and we need the claims processed and we need them processed oh, now. They'll hold a press conference like this every day this week at 10 a.m. Last week, the Georgia Department of Labor reported it has paid out $11 billion in state and federal unemployment benefits since the middle of March. Now, we reached out to the office about these requests today and are still waiting on a response. As some school districts prepare to welcome kids back into the classroom, a COVID-19 outbreak at a local YMCA summer camp is serving as a cautionary tale about how children can spread the virus. YMCA of Metro Atlanta now says it regrets opening Camp High Harbor after 260 of the nearly 600 campers and staff tested positive for COVID-19. Although the YMCA says the camp made every effort to adhere to best practices outlined by the CDC, a report least Friday shows the camp failed to adhere to two guidelines opening doors and windows for increased ventilation, and it only required staff to wear masks. The CDC recommends everyone wear them. Karen Jessup's two children attended the day camp. They did not test positive. I would not have done anything differently. I think the Y did a tremendous job, um, and it just goes to show you it, it is a virus and we can't prevent it. Medical experts say schools should be watching this outbreak and the White House is asking schools not to reopen if they are in areas with widespread community transmission. What happened in Georgia is a social experiment that should alarm any school teacher or principal. If you have high caseload and active community spread, just like we're asking people not to go to bars, not to have household parties, not to create large spreading events. We're asking people to distance learn at this moment. Many school districts in the metro are heeding that advice, but virtual learning, it's not always easy. Our Y guy explains why and what parents can do to help. 2020 has been a crash course on patience and adjustment. Few know that better than the people who are having to learn new ways to teach. We don't know what works. We haven't attempted all those different strategies. The new school year is shrouded in uncertainty. Let's look at why virtual teaching is a major adjustment for educators, students, and parents. Across the state, teachers got a taste of what's to come when the last school year ended with remote classes. By then, they were familiar with the needs of individual students. Some children learn through hearing it, some children learn through reading it. Finding a way to meet all of those things virtually is definitely one of the problems. Teachers will rely on a combination of videos and lesson plans sent home to students, as well as live virtual discussions. Lisa Morgan is an elementary school teacher and president of the Georgia Association of Educators. She says teachers will have to replace some tried and true methods. We have cubes that have letters printed on them so the children can put them together to make a word. And obviously they're not going to have that kind of thing at home. Morgan says parents will play an important role in helping teachers overcome the challenges. What do parents need to do? Communicate and communicate and communicate with your child's teacher. Tell them a little bit about your child, what you've observed about how they learn best. Morgan suggests that parents establish a routine, setting a schedule that students have to follow as if they were spending each day in the classroom. As the countdown continues for the August 11th Democratic primary runoff election, the battle heaps up for the Fulton County District Attorney's seat. Incumbent Paul Howard is battling opponent Fonnie Willis, who previously worked in his office as a deputy chief prosecutor. 
In the June 9th primary, Willis led with 42% of the vote, followed by Howard. A third candidate, Christian Wise, has since dropped out and endorsed Howard. In an exclusive interview with 11 Alive's Naima Abdullahi, Howard talks about the close race. He also addresses the GBI investigation, alleging he misused funding to help supplement his salary. Thank you so much for joining us. You are running again for district attorney of uh, Fulton County for the seventh time. Uh, you've held that position since 1997. How is this time different than previous times? I'm sure the state of the nation has changed and evolved, and our county has also changed and evolved. We've got to do something about policing in our communities. Um, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, uh, Rayshard Brooks, uh, and um, uh, they, they've triggered a nerve in our communities. And I think this election is different because I think that what people are asking us to do, since the DA is the gatekeeper of the criminal justice system, is to become a, an important part of that change. You are running against uh, Fonnie Willis. She's endorsed by Atlanta Police Union and former Atlanta mayor candidate, uh, Mary Norwood. How do you guys differ from your opinion, um, and what do you think about her endorsements from the Atlanta Police Union? Uh, Mary Norwood is inviting Republicans to take Democratic ballots and to vote in this election. I don't think that that's appropriate for the Republicans to try to influence an election. When the police union endorses the DA, what that indicates is that the DA will not prosecute policemen. And uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate for people, for DAs to accept uh, endorsements or funding from police unions. And during election season, we can always expect things to surface, right? With the GBI investigation that surfaced where there was an alleged use of nonprofit funds to supplement your salary. Let's also address that. Uh, be happy to, because this happened in um, 2014, I believe. Um, I um, uh, asked the uh, chief appellate person in my office to tell me whether or not uh, I could receive a salary from the city of Atlanta, salary supplement. And finally, I met with the mayor, asking them for a salary supplement from the city of Atlanta. Uh, they agreed that it was uh, my work had justified my receiving it. So I, I don't really care about what form of investigation takes place. As long as it's truthful, I believe at the end, I, I would be totally exonerated because what I did is what Americans do all the time. We ask for pay raises, pay increases, and that's what I asked for. That's what the city of Atlanta sent over based upon the work that I had performed for the city. Our Naeem Abdullahi asking the tough questions tonight and tonight on Uplate over on 11 Alive at 11. Howard is going to talk about the Rayshard Brooks case and his decision to quickly charge the officers, something that really drew a lot of criticism, whether it was a political move or the best decision. And later on this week, you'll hear from candidate Fonnie Willis on our air as she talks about her campaign as well. All right, well, Microsoft says it is moving forward with its plan to try and buy TikTok's operations in the United States. The announcement suggests that the White House is open to a deal that is not what President Trump said on Friday. The president said he would ban the app and would not approve a Microsoft takeover. TikTok's parent company is based in China. The administration is concerned about access to user information. TikTok says the Chinese government does not influence its business and it doesn't share data. Microsoft promises it would delete any data currently stored outside of the U.S. Fulton County is breaking down what went wrong in Georgia's primary election and trying to fix it. How they're switching up training for poll workers coming up. Hurricane Isaias, Isaias is making a close brush now with the coast of South Carolina and North Carolina about to make landfall. Stay with us. I'll let you know where it's headed after it moves in. And up next in sports football is around the corner. We're going to have a report from the first day of Falcons training camp coming up after the break. We're seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks.
Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Fulton County election officials say they have been hard at work making adjustments to the voting process after a really, uh, let's say, chaotic June primary, that's the best way to put it. And a big part of that is training poll workers. Mara Sirianni walks us through what's new ahead of the August 11th runoff. Here at the Fulton County Elections Preparation Center, they're focused on improving the process. Everything from poll worker training to staffing and absentee ballots. So you're going to insert the car. Two to four hours. That's how long it takes to become a certified Fulton County Elections poll worker. Officials say the in-person training is both crucial and safe. We've got PPE for training. We're limiting the number of people that go to class and everyone's required to wear a mask. We take temperatures before people go in. It covers opening and closing procedures for each precinct, a thorough understanding of the new voting machines and everything in between. Customer service oriented. They need to be uh, tech savvy. They need to be able to manage people. This new system has many more components to it than the previous system. So if somebody isn't savvy enough to recover from any sort of equipment issue, it makes it harder for the polling place to operate smoothly. On June 11th, Fulton County experienced high voter turnout and too many voters assigned to a single precinct. There were also equipment issues and staffing challenges due to COVID. 
Now each polling location will be staffed with one additional clerk and technician. Elections officials planning to launch a call center to handle absentee ballot requests. And this time around, the county is also equipped with more polling locations. We've added locations for the runoff. We're up to 174 and we are doing some things to get that number up to 220 for the presidential election. Elections officials say voters will be notified of their polling place two weeks prior to election day. And if you're interested in signing up to be a poll worker, head to 11alive.com and click on this story. We'll have a link to the Fulton County government's website. Joe Biden is interviewing finalists this week to decide who will be his running mate. Neither Georgia Democrat Stacey Abrams or Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms will say if they are still on the short list. Still, they are pushing for people to get out and vote. Mayor Bottoms on MSNBC said this is the most important election of our lifetime. And Abrams says issues with the primary show that we need money to scale up our elections. There is an intentional effort by the Republicans, led by the president, to undermine and intimidate voters out of participation through disinformation, through flat out lies and through using the systems against people. That's why we need to fight for free and fair elections through mail in voting, through in person voting early and through in person voting on the day of the elections without losing polling places. Congress can make this happen by passing the HEROES Act. The Senate is in the midst of debate and our deep hope is that they will do the right thing. But our fear is that they're going to leave cash strapped states without the ability to scale up for an unprecedented election. Abrams is also responding to President Trump as he casts doubt on the outcome of the election. He says widespread mail in voting could lead to fraud, something experts say has no hard evidence. Abrams calls that a distraction, but also says people should not expect to have the results on election night. A surge of mail in voting has contributed to some delays in some elections in the Wisconsin primary. For example, results were not announced until six days later. But the last time we had to wait past sunrise or results in a presidential election that was back in 2000. All right. So if any of you have questions out there about the November election, go ahead and shoot an email to our decision 2020 political team at where ATL speaks at 11 alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We are waiting for the 11 p.m. advisory to come in from the National Hurricane Center on Hurricane Isaias. And you can see the center of the storm. We really think that we may be seeing landfall right now, right there at the South Carolina and North Carolina line as the storm is moving northward. It's actually gained strength. It was upgraded to a hurricane at the 8 p.m. advisory with 75 mile an hour winds. And then at 9 o'clock, the Hurricane Center updated that again, saying it's now 85 mile an hour winds after they got some new data that came in from a Hurricane Hunters aircraft that flew into it. Take a look at the bigger picture right now because I want to zoom in a little bit tighter and you can see what we watch here is that center of circulation before it's an official landfall. You have to have the center of the circulation right here as it crosses over land and that's about to take place right now and we're just waiting to see how the uh, Hurricane Center is analyzing this and seeing if we actually have a landfall that is taking place right now. And you can see those storms on the the west side of the center are not as strong. We've got some good rain that's been coming in through Myrtle Beach with some rough surf there earlier. Heavier rain coming through parts of South Carolina, but these bands on the west side and in that northeast quadrant as the storm moves up toward the north are the strongest storms that are moving through. We've had numerous tornado warnings around the Wilmington area. Also, these bands moving up through North Carolina, those could have some strong storms in association with them. So it's more than just that eye or the center that we're waiting for. It's is really impacting a lot of people here. You can see uh, that storm as it was near Myrtle Beach earlier. It was 27 miles away. Now we think it's right here about to make landfall. This is the uh, South Carolina side and there's North Carolina. That's the state line right here. There you see Little River and Oak Island. This is where we're most likely going to see that landfall right there close to the state line as it continues moving northward. And there's all those storms here to the north and east of that system. Again, waiting for the last uh, little bit of information coming in from the Hurricane Center, showing this becoming a tropical storm as it moves north over land during the day tomorrow uh, and overnight as well. And then staying up to the north, becoming actually an area of low pressure once it finally uh, gets up to the north. But the entire Atlantic seaboard 
has um, uh, from North Carolina and South Carolina North where it has tropical storm warnings in effect. You can see those winds there. Even as the storm moves inland during the day tomorrow, those winds are really going to start kicking up here on that western side. So it's going to be causing a lot of rough surf in the mid-Atlantic region, strong winds, and that heads up to the New England area as well. So again, that new information just now coming in from the Hurricane Center. 90 degrees for a high tomorrow. Temperatures are, are going to be warm with a 30% chance for a shower, then a 20% chance for showers Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday uh, with uh, high temperatures in the lower 90s. All right, we got some really bad news for the Braves. Mike Soroka ruptured his right Achilles in the third inning of tonight's game against the Mets. Manager Brian Snicker says Soroka will be out for the remainder of the season. We hate to see that. We hope he is going to make a full recovery. The Braves lost tonight's game 7-2. to two. During the next two weeks, we will reveal the winners of Atlanta Sports Awards presented by the Atlanta Sports Council, culminating in the big awards show on August 15th, right here on 11 Alive. We begin with Outstanding Coach. You see your nominees. Here's the winner. Outstanding Coach, presented by the Home Depot. No, I'm excited to get the honor. Danny Hall has been a pillar at Georgia Tech. I've always prided myself on trying to do things the right way and, uh, you know, been very fortunate to be at a place like Georgia Tech. He's the all-time winningest coach at Georgia Tech. He's won ACC tournament titles and led Tech to the NCAA tournament 21 times and coached the Yellow Jackets all the way to the College World Series three times. He was also named the 2019 ACC Coach of the Year after leading the 2019 Jackets, a team that was picked to finish toward the bottom of the conference standings, all the way to winning the division. The Jackets made it back to the NCAA Tournament for the first time since 2016. And now looking forward to 2021, how do you keep this success going? I just keep working hard. You know, it, it's an unusual time. We'll all get through this. There, there is light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Uh, but we have a lot to, you know, be thankful for, but a lot to look forward to. The Falcons together for the first time as a team in Flowery Branch this afternoon. Maria Martin was there at training camp with more on the first practice. I feel like everybody over here has been doing a pretty good job of you know, making sure we stay safe and doing all the protocol stuff. Everything is different in 2020, but there have had to be some serious adjustments in order to have a 2020 NFL season here at Flowery Branch. There were a lot of masks being worn at training camp today, and guys were working out in groups without the coaches because no coaches for the acclimation period. New running back Todd Gurley, he's excited to be here. For me to be 26, for me to be my sixth year in the league, um, still get an opportunity to play, you know, running back. Do something I love, do something I've always done. I'm, I'm always appreciative and, and grateful. It's pretty wild to have the team together for the first time on August 3rd, but the guys are grateful to be eased in during a pandemic. Getting guys acclimated back to moving around, whether we run the plays, run the stunts, um, just so we're not going straight zero to 100 and uh, thinking about the health part of it for the players. I'm a vet, so I'm not going to complain about uh, not having you no know, real training camp in August right about now. So. I'm just enjoying the process, man. Like you said, everybody's kind of dealing with the same situation, you know, all 32 teams. And this is one of those things where you just kind of got to control what you can control. The guys will keep getting eased into things and we'll start in pads on August 17th. All right, football slowly coming back. Stick around. We'll be right back. CDC.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews. We're continuing to watch those rain chances that are going to be going down uh, to 30% tomorrow. High temperatures still warm up to 90 degrees. And then we're going to see lower rain chances Wednesday through Monday. Only a 20% chance for a shower each day with high temperatures that'll be in the lower 90s. Stay with us. Flip over to 11 Alive right now for up late as we track Isaias making landfall. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.